Okay, good morning, everybody, again. My name is uh, Brett Husky. Thank you very much. I'm a pastoral apprentice here at Grace Saskatoon, and it's uh, my honor, as it always is, to come up uh, before you and, and help lead us in God's Word, looking at God, what God has for us here this morning. And uh, as you might know, we're in the, the book of Luke, closing out chapter 13 today. And if you've been sticking with the study, it's been a bit of a wild ride through chapter 13. Like looking back, Jesus has had some really difficult things to say to us in this chapter, all for our good and upbuilding. But today as well, is going to be, it's not going to be very different. In fact, today's text will be uh, not only just difficult, but even scary. Um, So let's get right into it. Let's have our scripture reading now. We'll look into this together, and I'll come back up here, and we will talk. Yeah. Reading from Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 35. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, and then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, Your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, so just believe with me. Let's pray together to begin. Heavenly Father, we love you for your word, which is this gift and this light to us, and we love you for the teaching of Jesus here. I pray, Lord, that uh, we can get this right and and sit under it as authoritative over us, Lord God, that you'd bless us to have right understanding of what you mean here and go down below the surface and and really understand that our hearts would be open to you as Lord, that our hearts would be open to you and what you have for us here in this text, in Jesus' name. And this this sermon is not my own. This is... uh, the Gray Saskatoon team coming together and guarding you from my sermon <laughs> and helping me go deeper and helping me see and understand. So this really is a collective and a big uh, emphasis on the importance of shared leadership, shared leadership and collective use of the gifts of different men and women. And so uh, to begin, we find Jesus in this text journeying towards Jerusalem, which is really as we know, the journey toward the cross. And and somewhere along the way, he's asked the question in verse 23, and someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And this question is most likely a response to what Jesus was just teaching about in chapter 13, how the kingdom of God is like, he compared it to like a grain of mustard seed or a little bit of leaven that was buried in so much flour 
And I think the hang up then for the person who asks this question is he's thinking about how small those things are. He's thinking about how small those things are, perhaps missing the point of what Jesus is actually making. And so he asked the question, will only a few people be saved then since the kingdom is so small? And this is just like us, very relatable. This person is to me when we struggle to focus on the deeper issues of our own heart, which Jesus appears as we read about him in the scripture. He's, he's, he's always after in his teachings to get to our heart. And we miss the point in regards sometimes to what Jesus is actually saying if we only stay up here. And like he so often does, he just goes right in and he redirects the question to address this person directly regarding their own heart and salvation. And I wonder if the person asking this question, just to get rolling here, he's already made the assumption that that they're getting in. He's already made the assumption that he's saved. And I think that that's probably the case because that is what I do. I think that's what we tend to do. We assume Jesus is always talking about those people over there. He's always talking about those evil people, and we tend to ignore the evil that's actually in here, and it's in there, and I don't think Jesus is going to let us get away with that today, starting here in verse 24. So in response to the question, Lord, will those who are to be saved few, he answers, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many will seek to enter and will not be able. So in response to the question, again, he immediately goes below the surface of the theological question of how many people are in the kingdom, how many people are in hell. He goes below the surface of a theological question of how many make it into the kingdom, kingdom and he takes it to the heart level and he says, will you be there? He commands us, you strive to enter through the one and only door. You go through this very narrow entry point into salvation, which is Jesus, which is the way God is made into the kingdom through his son. Make sure you enter in there. That's the emphasis. Take personal responsibility for yourself. Man, woman, and child, take personal responsibility for yourself because that's the only person you can control and strive to enter through the narrow door. And don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything hinder you from entering that narrow door for Jesus says, many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Many will seek to enter. Many want heaven when they die, but they're not getting in, Jesus says. And it's because they're not seeking to enter through that narrow door that God has provided. They're seeking to get in some other way. And and they want to be in a good place. They want heaven but they don't submit to God's only plan and his only provision to get in, in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he continues in verse 25 there. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I don't know where you come from. So that one place of entry that narrows down to this single person in history, Jesus, it will not always be open. And once the master of the house has risen and when he decides that it is time, that door will be shut. And the many in our text who are seeking, they're striving to enter another way, the door they actually need to be striving for is shut on them because Jesus doesn't know them. They call Jesus Lord. They call Jesus Lord. They're even expecting to get in, I think. But they don't truly love him. And Jesus says to them, I don't know where you come from, which is to say, I don't know you. Meaning they don't have a relationship with Jesus. They're not in a covenant relationship with Jesus. And these people in the text, remember, are just like us. They're not those evil people over there. We're not getting away with that today, unfortunately. Or fortunately, these people are just like us, very much so, who, you know, they're hardworking, good people. They're, they're living a good life. They've made a profession of faith. They got baptized. 
they believe Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and so we assume we're getting in. We assume we're in right standing with Jesus, but Jesus isn't taking us in as one of his own, as someone he knows, someone he's in loving, covenantal relationship with. And he says in verse 26, listen to Jesus, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he'll say to you, I tell you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. So these are individuals who hung around Jesus. He's addressing people who listened to his teachings, much like us today at Christian gatherings or in homes, hearing from the Bible what Jesus said and did, even agreeing with it and agreeing that much of it's really good. And Jesus again says, I don't know you. I don't know you, but this time he adds the phrase, all you workers of evil. And what are the works of evil? That's when we, we want heaven. We're seeking heaven. We call Jesus Lord with our lips. And we have a knowledge of him, but we don't actually want him. We don't actually want him. We want our own kingdom. We want a heaven that revolves around us. Don't leave me here. But we don't actually want him. God is this means to get what we want. It's like calling Jesus Lord, but then not, not giving up ultimate control of our own life. Hanging on to control of our own life. It's like having listened to his teaching, but not trusting him enough to obey his words. Jesus is not enough. That's what that says. Jesus is not enough. And this is when our motives are ultimately for, for self-glory, self-fulfillment, and not God's glory, and not love for him. When he is the creator of all things, and we're the creature. God is the maker, and we're the clay. So to seek heaven, but not be willing to seek Jesus as the door and the means God provided is evil. Because it's trying to make it about me and not about God and what he's done. My way and not God's way. My truth and not God's truth. To call Jesus Lord and only submit to what is agreeable to me. Like when Jesus is speaking a hard truth and he's been doing this for weeks through chapter 13. When he speaks a hard truth or something I don't like, if I ignore it. Or if I justify my own disobedience to it, what I'm doing is trying to make Jesus a part of my life, but not let him reign as Lord over all of my life. Not let him reign over all of my heart. It's like saying Jesus is Lord, but then actively trying to just shoo him away from the throne. Oh man, and, and spitting in the face, and this is not an overstatement, it's Spit it in the face of God who offers me peace through Jesus Christ as the way into salvation and denying him his rightful place. It's evil. It's, it's a work of evil when we call him Lord and spend time with his church and with his people in his presence and the whole time just be after what he can do for us and not who he is and not who he is in truth. It's using God as a means to the end, and I'm not getting in with that. I'm not getting in, in verse 28. It says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the place where we don't get in, the place where the door is much to our surprise suddenly shut, uh, we will weep. But this is not repentance. So when we see that, when we read that here, don't picture some poor, innocent creature who just wanted heaven and this big, mean old God is standing back like you're not getting in. The tears that, shed, that are shed in that place, they're not tears of repentance. This weeping, if it lines up with the rest of the description of those who are cast out, this is a sadness all about ourself. This is weeping for our suffering and our consequences and our bad circumstances. So these are they're tears of self-pity. 
because it's all about us. And these tears, they, they come with anger. They come with blame toward God. It's all because of him. I'm outside. I'm not getting in because he won't let me in. My suffering, it's his fault. I didn't bring this on myself. And there's this gnashing of teeth, which represents all over the scripture, this hatred towards somebody. And in this case, it's hatred towards God, who we will ultimately blame for our end. Like, man, I worked so hard. I read the Bible. I went to church. I gave my money. I did the thing. I tried to be a good person. Like, you owe me this. And in that place, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, verse 28, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom, the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And he goes on in verse 29. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, some are first who will be last. So people will enter from all over, every direction, to do what? What does that say? Recline. Recline at table in the kingdom of God. Like, give me some of that. Whose table is it? Whose table? It's God's table. Whose kingdom is it? God's kingdom. It's Jesus' kingdom. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is saying, it's my home. It's my table. And you can only come on my terms, which are that you love me. And you see the extent I've gone to love you. And this, this isn't just for Israel, praise God. No, people from every direction are going to come in. And just because Jesus came to Israel first, doesn't mean he's stopping there. Praise God. In fact, some who Jesus came to first will be last because Jesus is the door into the kingdom. And whoever rejects the door, even Israel, isn't getting in to the kingdom. Because there's, there's no other way. Jesus is the means God has provided through his son crucified where a sacrifice is made and freely given to those who will repent and believe into Jesus and enter into fellowship with him. And that's where we surrender our will, our thinking, our own preferences, hear me, our understanding of right and wrong, our lives, we surrender them to him as Lord and we take up his will and we start to pick up his thinking and what he says is right and wrong. So we have to align our mind with God's and see Jesus in truth for who he is and what he's done to love us so we can stop just walking all over the blood of Jesus like it's some common thing. Nobody can come before God on their own terms. It's on his terms, which are awesome. God's terms are so Good, where the worst sinner, the, the absolute worst among us, can just raise the white flag. He can just throw it up and surrender to Jesus in faith. Treasuring him for who he is and what he's done and trust that what Jesus has done is enough. That door is enough. But our pride and our self-sufficiency and our independence has got to go. It's got to go. We don't like admitting we're wrong. We don't like that we deserve to be cast out. We don't like admitting that we deserve hell. And I don't know how that strikes you, but that's true. We deserve hell because of our treatment of Jesus and his father is evil. We're so bent as a people on just trying to build our own identity, our own value. We're building our identity on our own worth. But Jesus has something so much better for us, of so much more value and of so much more worth. Let's go back in the text here in verse 31. It says at that very hour, the hour Jesus is explaining this and teaching this to his disciples, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. 
And he said to them, go and tell that fox, got to love Jesus. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. <laughs> Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So these guys show up again, and I can picture just Jesus. He's walking along, and he's, and he's teaching is this really hard truth, and it's like suddenly there's these hecklers shouting at him, saying, get away from here, <laughs> you know, Herod wants to kill you, you should probably keep going, get out of here, and I, I really doubt, I doubt that they're trying to help Jesus, I doubt they're trying to do Jesus a favor here, I don't know for sure, but I do love his response, I love Jesus' response, go and tell that fox, if he wants to kill me, he can find me doing exactly what I've been doing, he's not changing the plan, and Jesus' kingdom doesn't bend the knee to another. There's no other kingdom that it folds to. So he's focused on the goal here. And remember where he's going. Where is he going? What's the goal? What's at Jerusalem? There's a cross there, right? And he's set his face. About chapter 9, the book shifted, and Jesus set his face now. I'm going to Jerusalem toward the finish line, and nothing's going to derail that. So Jesus, the ultimate prophet, is choosing to go willingly to where the prophets perish, which is such good news. This is such good news for a sinner like me, because I do live my life so often without Jesus at the center. And so often I would call him Lord, but live as if I am. And there's times I will... I want Jesus to come and fix the problem, but I don't want him to hang out after he fixes it. I don't want to spend time with him. So sometimes I just want to use God for his stuff, like my family and my abilities and my time, my body. That's all God's stuff. That's, that's his stuff. And for all my wrong thinking and for all my self-centered motives and all my unbelief and the lack of love I have for Jesus, there's a cross for that. There's a cross for that. Jesus finished his course. And in the events of the cross at Jerusalem where Jesus perishes, uh, something remarkable happens there. It's in the procession of these awful events where he's mistreated and he's abused and beaten and he's ripped open with this cruel whip and weakened in shock to the point of he can't really carry the, the wood they've strapped across his open back. And he's led outside the gate of the city. He's literally taken through the door and cast outside the wall to a cross where he's cast outside the kingdom of God. Condemned outside the door. And Jesus in love, he was shut out so that we don't have to be. And Jesus heard his father say, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, you worker of evil, so that we, the wretches, we, the undeserving, the sinners, could hear him say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your Lord. Come on in. Come on in. And it's as if we would pass him there, in the doorway, in our sins and the, the just judgment of God that's being held back from us is unleashed upon him and it's, it's pressed down into Jesus' wounds. Well, the perfect righteousness of the Son of God, the, the, the way God has made for us to enter into the kingdom is transferred to us and the only blood spilt to pay for that, to afford us, this is his. And the only blood on us is his, and what that means is that the blood stained narrow door that God has provided for us a way into the kingdom, it's him. It's Jesus. Jesus is the narrow door, and it's not then that we want heaven. It's not then that, that we just want to get in. No, but that we want him. We want him who so loved us that he gave himself that we would never perish that we would have eternal life. And now listen to the love in Jesus' voice here. 
in verse 34, here's the heart of our Lord Jesus in all of this. Pardon me. In, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. The extent to which Jesus has gone to open the door into the kingdom of God can never, ever, ever be overstated. It cost him everything. And he wants now to gather in the children. He's seeking you and calling. Jesus is pursuing you. The people who are following him, people who are identifying with him, people who are seeking to enter heaven, people who call him Lord. Jesus says, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. We have some chickens at home, and mysteriously, uh, we had a chick. We only have one. And there's this little, tiny, cute, little fuzzy thing, and all it wants to do is just nestle under that hen, and the hen's just willing. It's just got that thing pinned down. How perverse would it be if that chick would only stay in the corner? If that chick wouldn't come to its mother? It would be so backwards. And anyone not coming in, anyone not coming through the door to dwell with Jesus, it is because they are not willing to bow the knee to him, to come on his terms, because they don't see who he is. They don't see his amazing grace and love, and they don't treasure him as beautiful and just the answer to every longing of our hearts. And I think what God is doing now with one hand, he is holding back his judgment from us. He's holding it there. He's postponing it and he's got it. And with the other nail pierced hand, he is begging you to come this way. Come this way, repent and be gathered to him. He's pleading with you and he's waving you over, Over through this door, through the cross of Christ, he's calling you, he's reminding you, even right now, he's pleading with you to strive this way, come this way, saying, don't let anything stop you, because the day is coming when both of those hands get dropped, and the door gets shut, and it will be too late. And it's not that God isn't letting you in, it's not that he's not letting you in. It's not that God is standing back with his arms crossed, but his arms were nailed wide open for you. Wide open for you. If you're not coming in, it's because you're not willing. You're not willing to come in. The last verse we have today says, Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our own house, what we're building, what we're trusting in to get in with is broken. Uh, It is forsaken. Your religious system, your pride, your efforts, they're, they're forsaken. And until we see Jesus for who he is, and he's literally with these people, and he's telling them, you will not see me. Until we see Jesus for who he really is in, in all of his beauty and all of his grace, until we see him for the treasure he is, we're never going to see that heaven is centered on him. He is the centerpiece. He is the pinnacle. He is the everything. And he's not a means to an end. Nobody's gold digging on Jesus. Okay? He is the ends. That's what this is saying. I'm not saying this. Jesus is saying this. It's about him. It's his kingdom. It's his table. It's his house. And Jesus is enough. And if we can just see him for who he is and what he's done, the extent, the great extent to which Jesus has gone to love you 
and his deep desire to have you come in, repenting and trusting him alone, we will be welcomed in, and we will recline at table in the kingdom of God. So don't let anything stop you from that, because he's talking to you. He's talking to me. Don't let anything get in your way, but run to the store. And I just add, let's run to Jesus and repent of our evil works and be welcomed in because Jesus, he's willing. He is willing. And Jesus is faithful to forgive and welcome us in. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the extent with which you have gone to make a way. Before you, there was no way in. And we were all outside the door, outside the gate. And your cross has made a way for us to come in. And the doorposts and the lintel are stained with your blood, and it's the only way. And thank you that your heart is for us to come in. Your heart is willing to have us enter in on your merit, on your account, on everything you have done, you've done because you took everything we did. You took all the garbage, all the sin, and you let it just stain you. And you took the hit so that we not only didn't have to, but so that we could then come in and just enjoy the treasure of who you are. God, help us to see and desire you. It is truly all about you, Jesus. And we thank you for this time and this word in Jesus' name. Amen.